Welcome to Panels and Borders. I'm Dominic, and I've got a special guest on my channel. I've got Ash on Comics, and we're going to be talking about his channel and comics and whatever else comes up. Uh, so, how's it going, Ash? Hey, hey, very good. Uh, thanks for having me on, Dominic. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on, and it's always nice to have a fellow comic book fan on the channel. Uh, so just uh, for anyone who's uh, subscribed to my channel that doesn't know anything about you or your channel, just kind of want to introduce yourself and just kind of explain what your channel is and what it's all about. Yeah, certainly. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's going to be a long-winded answer probably because that's <laughs> my nature. But uh, So I've been a fan of comics, say, going back to the mid-80s was the first time I bought a comic and... I started collecting at Uncanny X-Men 210. That was my first issue of a book. And uh, I was just sucked in. So for about 10 years, I just was head over heels into comics, mostly Marvel, um, some select independents. Indies were kind of a breakout thing back at that point. And, um, you know, and of course, everyone like Superman and Batman and things and you know when I was a little kid Super Friends was like my favorite thing and for whatever reason is superheroes the mythology the idea of superheroes has just really been part of my DNA mm -hmm. uh, about the mid 90s I started getting some burnout um, Marvel was in the aftermath of the whole image uh, fiasco, which was great for independent comics. I loved Image, and I loved what was happening, but it really left a big crater at Marvel, and they didn't know how to recover very well, and a lot of the books that I was loving, especially X-Men, just started going downhill, and I was uh -huh. just like, this is not the same joy I used to have, and then I don't actually remember a specific thing. Nothing like triggered me. I never got pissed off or anything. I just sort of just faded off, and other things grabbed my interest, and I moved on. Uh -huh. And, um, it always, always kept my interest, you know, and from time to time I would come back, you know, in the early 2000s, like Frank Miller, who's probably my all-time favorite creator, did a sequel to Dark Knight Returns, so I came back and got that, you know, and then the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the mid-2000s came out, and that Iron Man was spectacular, and, you know, everyone remembers that, so I kind of kept my ear to things, and I was in other related hobbies that constantly kept me seeing comics, you know, from the outside, and uh, I was, every time I'd like think, oh, maybe I should kind of check out. And then I just remember, I, I, even when I wasn't in comics, I just remember that the whole Captain America is a Nazi. And I just uh. <laughs> lost myself. I was like, what, what the hell is going on in my absence in comics? What are they doing over there? And then I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess, I guess it's not the right time to, I'll just go back to what I was doing. And then, you know, like, I think it was like a year later, maybe, or two years. I don't know how long it was. It wasn't really timing. And then next I heard, like, oh, they're turning four into a woman. And I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, you can take most any other character. You yeah. Know, you, you can make Iron Man. You can make Iron Woman. You know, you could you could even make Captain America to technically a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone can sort of, like, because it's a mantle. The Thor was like a, a person. It's a name. It's a god. It's a being. <laughs> yeah. You can't just replace an identity and say, oh, yeah, this Thor did. Odin didn't have a son. He had, he had a daughter. <laughs> so I was just like, okay, this is nutso. And uh, then something a little bit later, somehow I got, I don't know, it's because I was into other hobbies that were, like I said, close to comics. I came across a YouTube channel. Uh, diversity in comics, which I'm sure everyone is listening to this is yeah. aware of what it is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's this guy just talking about some comics and stuff, and it just grabbed my ear. And I was just like, oh, I just found myself interested in what he had to say. And what really grabbed me was not that he was bashing on comics. Uh, and he was. He was roasting them and pointing out all the things. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, whenever you dislike something and someone else is making fun of it, you kind of want to dislike. It's fun to listen in and be like, yeah, you tell them. Yeah. But what really got me was his passion. You could tell he wasn't a hater of it. He loved comics. And as much as he would roast comics, he would always find other books that he's still like, oh, look at this one. It's doing right. It's doing something really cool. 
And that spoke to me. It's what it reached into that DNA that I mentioned in the beginning, my love for the comics. And I was like, oh, yeah. And there was something about way, the way Zach, our boy Zach, Richard C. Meyer, his appreciation for comics seems to be really similar to my own. So I started listening to his channel a lot and just getting kind of sucked into the whole thing that was going in on at the time and the, the, the building of comics gate uh -huh. um, and things like that. And I was like, just fascinated. I mean, I'm fascinated from a sociological aspect of just people and the culture war fascinated from the industry aspect that is part of my, you know, love and things. And also just, I like, comics and i love listening to people and talking to people like we are today just about this it's something that's part of me and i love talking about it so it got to a point where about six months in i was like you know i'm tired of listening uh, i want to be in on this like i want to participate now so i was like i'm gonna start buying some comics and that was a little over a year ago it was right as white knight batman white knight was coming out uh -huh. and i had missed like the first like three or four issues and he was raving about it and other people were raving about it and i was just like this is the right i need to jump in on this i need to check this out so i, I started getting that title i started subscribing to a few other titles uh, like superman um batman of course um and i decided you know what since some since marvel's dead and Mar at this point i should mention marvel was dead to me uh, <laughs> it's like i as much as i love marvel i'm not one of these people that wants to see necessarily marvel burn but I do want to see them hit rock bottom so that they can yeah. realize, hey, we need to fix. We, um, so I was like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna support this. I'm not gonna, I, I, I'm not gonna pay money to read about the characters I love done in a really poor light. It's, yeah. it's not, that's not entertaining to me. I don't, I love X Men, but I am not gonna pay you three ninety nine an issue to be pissed off at what, what you're doing. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to buy some DC. All those years ago, I used to thump my nose up to DC Comics, but I'm going to check it out. And it, it's had a twofold effect. Number one, it's got me back into comics, which was exciting and kind of getting back into something that I loved, but then also being able to experience it kind of like a newbie uh -huh. because I, I know Marvel. Well, I don't know new Marvel, but I used to know Marvel like the back of my hand. And, and now it's like, I, I don't Green Lantern. Some guy with the ring. I know that. But this whole Green Lantern core and the whole mythos behind them and all the different lights, and I'm like, I'm lost, you know. And I'm, so I'm, <laughs> I'm having a fun time being like what a newbie is when they first discover their first comic and they don't know all the, you know, decades of backstory. Um, so I was really, really uh, enjoying that, and, and now I'm subscribing. My my pull list is about a little over hundred dollars a month. So. Uh, I tried to be small, but it's tough, uh, and, and then regulating that. And shortly after collecting comics for a while, because I wanted to be part of the conversation, I just didn't want to listen anymore. I was like, you know what? I, just what Zach is doing. I just, and I don't want to do videos in my car, but the whole like yeah. just plop out a comic and talk about it. I want to do that. Uh, I just that's something I can do. I never sought out to be like a YouTube star. Obviously, I'm not gonna be. Um, but I love talking to comics, and if there are people that want to hear about, you know, what I have to say, and, and apparently there are, there's a couple people that listen to me that want to hear what I have to say, <laughs> um, that that makes it worth it. If there's five people that want to engage with me, that's fantastic. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, therapeutic in some ways. It's been fulfilling. Um, you get to meet new people and hear what their loves and joys of comics, their frustrations. And so that's really what started me. I mean, there's other influencers, you know, other people that do channels. Some have come and gone. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of my favorites aren't around anymore. Uh, they either burned out or moved on. Or I don't know. Um, some of my other favorites have kind of mutated into a different type of voice that isn't necessarily what I want to listen to. Yeah. And um, some new new up and comers. So I've met new people that have started channels based on what I'm doing. Like they were my audience for a while, and now all of a sudden they're doing a channel, and I'm like, oh, cool! I'm subscribing to you now. And um, so that's what got me into it. It's basically, kind of, I guess you could call me a wannabe Zach, although I'm not really trying to <laughs> be a big shot or anything. I just yeah. want to have fun talking about comics. Yeah. Um, so that 
my, I guess my next question is, so how did you, was it through diversity in comics that you became aware of like the culture war that's kind of going on right now? Um, I think through diversity of comics was my beyond the headlines view of the culture war. I kind of knew it was there because, you know, I, I saw the headlines from, from afar and uh -huh. listening to Zach got me more of like reading the whole news story. You know, I like got to learn of the details, what was actually happening, you know, and, um, that was where I started finding it fascinating. It's like, it's it's one thing to know, hey, Marvel turned Thor into a, a girl. Yeah. But to know all of the history of what's going on at the company that led up to this and who's pulling the strings and what's happening and seeing, you know, how they're treating customers. These things I was not aware of uh -huh. until I got involved, until I got onto Twitter. And I was just like, geez, what is what is happening <laughs> seeing it for myself then i started seeing it for myself and it was like wow you know uh, and that's kind of also what sunk at home for me is because you know you can listen to a guy claim hey all this is happening and then you kind of like involve yourself and then it starts happening to you and yeah. all of a sudden it's not a claim anymore it's this is real like you know you just tell us oh yeah i saw a, a ufo oh really okay that's great and then all of a sudden ufo flies over your house you're like oh cool Okay. Yeah. You know, then that's what that's what really kind of sucked me in is when, when it started happening to me. Yeah. Then it changes things. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, it's <clears throat> it's interesting the whole uh, thing that's going on now. As for myself, I kind of started to dip out of Marvel just before all the SJW stuff hit. I was a big collector of the Incredible Hulk and Batman, and just before they switched them over to the Amadeus Cho Hulk, just before that I quit. Um, I wasn't, I, I didn't, wasn't really picking up on anything as far as like uh, the social justice stuff goes at that point. But uh, for me, it was a lot of the reboots and mass crossover events that it was getting hard for me to keep track of what was going, what was going on. So I just gave up. And then started collecting Valiant. But now they're going full social justice too. But at the time they weren't. They were a really good alternative. But even but now they're going down that route. Uh, so same thing. Yeah, Valiant from and I and I'm sad that I wasn't aware until just recently, but Valiant from about two thousand and twelve to oh, I don't know, twenty eighteen was just doing a bang up job um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm discovering it for myself actually uh, and I've collected now I, I have almost I'm missing just number one of the current most recent Exo Man of War um, I got all the Bloodshot Salvations and Ninjax and then I just that's where I kind of discovered Valiant and then I was like oh they did stuff before that and it's even better and I'm like really? <laughs> um, so I, I'm sad because I wish I would have been there and I wish I could have promoted. This is a thing like this is an example of comics do being great. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing that I think gets lost in the current culture war thing is, you know, you have two sides. People think there's nothing wrong with comics. Everything's fine. You know, and then you have the other side that's like, no, comics is dead. And what got me trash. There's so much trash. There's so mm -hmm. much, you know, it's, it's an open wound right now. We need to get it to the emergency room stat, you know, but it's not dead. No. There are good things out there, and that's what grabbed me. And it's like, here's a company, Valiant, who was one time phenomenal, got bought by a claim, went through this mediocrity, and, you uh -huh. know, they bought themselves back from a claim, started again, arguably maybe were even better on the second round. And people just didn't know because comics yeah. had become so bad. And here it's like, oh, Valiant, whatever, you know. And it's like you just read one of these books; they're so good. They're they're as good as anything in the greatest era of any era of comics. Like, and uh -huh. here we are amidst this wasteland where everyone's like, "There's nothing good anymore." And it's like, oh no, there is, and we all missed it because we were so focused on Marvel and DC that someone was doing something great and. Only a few people saw it. Yep. Yeah, and uh, what the other thing I liked about uh, Valiant, it was a much smaller universe 
and it was easier to keep track of what was going on uh, because they have fewer characters. Where Marvel, like, just take Spider-Man. There's, like, so many different versions of Spider-Man. I don't even know where half of them came from. You got Spider-Gwen, uh, Spider-Woman, uh, then you got the uh, Miles Morales Spider-Man, and then they had, like, the Spider-Universe, stuff like that. I find... It doesn't help either that they, like, call the characters the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, help. I understand why Miles Morales was called Spider-Man, because once upon a time, he was in the Ultimates universe. Yeah. And... So, okay, that was their version of Spider-Man. But when you brought him into the Marvel universe, why do they have to have the same name? You know, we, I'm sure someone could come up with something that rings true. Um, and then it's like, oh, but now it's not even that there's two Spider-Men, there's three. Because we've got Doc Ock is running around as a Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. And now they're doing a fourth Spider-Man of the symbiote <clears throat> Spider-Man, who technically is the real Spider-Man, but it's not continuity. And then <laughs> you're just like, I was talking about this with someone the other day. It's like, I could just plop down three Spider-Man books, Superior Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, and I think it's just Miles Morales' Spider-Man. And say, so here you go, here's three Spider-Man books, and if you were a newbie to comics and didn't know any better, you'd just be confused and be like, wait a second, why are these... I don't understand. I thought this was Spider-Man. <laughs> you'd be lost. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like, it's very... Con I find once they got rid of the Ultimate Marvel Universe and they kind of folded Miles Morales into the regular Mar Marvel Universe, it almost made him redundant. Yeah. Well, yeah, well and that's, unfortunately, what part of the culture war. It's, it's the... We need diversity. We mm -hmm. have to. We have to have diversity because if someone out there is reading comic books and they don't have someone that looks like them, smells like them, then they can't enjoy comic books. Yeah, they, that's that's the argument. They can't relate. Which is a confounding argument because it's like, okay, so you're telling me then because I'm, you know, uh, Northern European descent, blonde hair, blue eye that I can't like Miles Morales. So that's what you're telling me. That, that you know... Yeah, almost... This is, but... this is, fool, this is foolishness. Like, I, I don't have a problem. The only people that seem to have problems are the people pointing at me and telling me I'm the racist. Yeah. <laughs> like, but you're the one needing it to be a certain race. I, I don't know. Uh, and, and the thing about it, too, is it's... I don't know. They, they make these characters but they're they're using the coattails of a past character to try to ride on that fame like Riri Williams they're trying to get her to ride the Iron Man wave kind of thing instead of just making up an original character that's my biggest problem with or it's not a problem with comics gate it's the biggest thing that I align with in comics gate and the argument about the, the culture war in, in comics is because I am a hundred percent hundred percent okay if you want to make a new character and whatever ethnic background or gender you want to make this character, whatever, it's fine. But when you need to hijack an existing character, you know, if you want to come in the sandbox and play toys with me and you want to bring your toys to the sandbox and play, I'm off. I'm fine. But if you want to come into the sandbox and grab all my toys and throw them away and say, you have to play with these now, that's when I have a problem. Mm -hmm. Captain America isn't yours to to mess around with, or Thor or Hulk. Uh, these exist. They've had their fans. Th these characters exist because of those fans who have been dedicated and loyal for decades and decades. And you just decide that, oh, well, I need my certain social agenda quotas met. So I know if I make some random new character, no one will care. So I'll just force you to care by replacing all the characters you love so that you have to pay attention. You know, you, you if you want Captain America, you have to have my Captain America. If you want Thor, you gotta yeah. have my Thor. If you want Hulk, you gotta have my Hulk. You know, and it's just like, that's the problem. And it's so hypocritical. It is yeah. so incredibly, can you imagine the outrage? Just imagine if, a group of people like if, imagine if the patriarchy was real <laughs> for a second the white patriarchy imagine yeah. if Marvel was a bunch of white misogynistic old men who generally were racist like everyone wants to say 
and they decide, you know what? We're tired of Black Panther being a black guy. We're going to replace him with this new white guy. Oh, yeah. You just sure. imagine people flipping their lids. Oh, they would, yeah. Right? And I'm like, there, sure. th- there you go. There you go. If it's not right for all characters, it's not right for any. And so that's what principles are. You can't, you can't just, oh, it's okay when we do it, but not when you do it. You know, that's, that doesn't work. Yeah, and uh, it's true. And the other thing that I've noticed about it is they'll make up a minority character, but then it's like they're using the minority character not to tell a good story, but to uh, push their politics in a very preachy way. So, and uh, so like, okay, you're not doing that minority minorities any good, and really because you're you're you're, you're just using their. I, can't, I made the analogy. It's like just say the. Uh, the minority is a wheelbarrow and their ide- ideology is the dirt in the wheelbarrow and they're using it to fill up a ditch you know what i mean they're just it's just a like it's just a hollow shell of a character and it's just basically a vessel for their politics exactly um another a great example is recently one of the things when i got into dc uh the metal event was winding down and i missed the metal event but picked up I saw they were doing this new thing with it called the new age of heroes and I gotta tell you in my opinion going back to you know the mid 80s which is when I think comics really started becoming excellent uh-huh. um, it is one of the greatest com- like comic events and initiatives that a company has tried to do of, of, of all of all time I think the new age of heroes it failed for sure like it didn't succeed but not because it was a bad idea. Maybe it was yeah. bad execution. Maybe there was other, you know, maybe the industry is suffering. There's probably a lot of reasons why it failed, but not because it was a dumb idea. As far as an idea, it's one of the greatest ideas and initiatives put forth and perfectly uh, fitted for DC. Like, DC needed this. Uh-huh. Like, Marvel, it probably would not have worked because Marvel is really varied, but DC is kind of insular with their character line. And they kind of suffer from an almost an incestuous, and I don't mean that sexually, but just where it eats like the same ideas and they can't break outside of this mold that they've established that keeps getting more refo- reinforced decade after decade. And I was like, you've got to be able to break out of the shell. You've got to be more than just Justice League characters. Um, yeah. And a new age of heroes was, it was like this attempt. And I thought it was brilliant because it was like DC looking at Marvel saying, oh, you want to, you want to screw up your, all your line of characters? How about we do your characters the right way? And it was kind of a jab. You know, they had their... If you look at that lineup, you have, like, the Terrifics, which is kind of analogous to the Fantastic Four. You got the Immortal Men, which was analogous to the X-Men. Sideways, which is, like, Spider-Man. Damage, like, the whole... You know, you had these yeah. things that weren't exactly... They weren't, like, copycats. But you could see the connection. And it was, like... Here we're gonna do, we're gonna do your characters, you know, your type of comics the right way, and they were the, the New Age of Heroes. Uh, at least six of the books were, I think, really well done, had great potential, and every single one of these books, every single one of them, was diverse, uh, more so than they probably really needed to be. Yeah. Like every single, the only kid, one except maybe sorry, it was Sideways was like a white kid, uh-huh. but it, it was a singular book but all the team books were full of like asians hispanics black people you know just every single one but it was done in such a low-key way yeah it wasn't like hey look at us we're being diverse it was just like here's some new characters they just threw them out there and as i started reading the books even i was in the middle of this culture war i wasn't even aware at first until a couple issues in i was like and i'm sitting here doing reviews on my channel i'm sitting here going look at these books oh yeah look at this 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 guy this team has an Asian guy and a Mexican guy and here's you know like wow yeah and I was like that's what it dawned on me that this is how you do it you do it without just just, like the way Marvel used to do it they didn't make Storm Black because they were trying to push some sort of social agenda they were just like here's an Egyptian goddess yeah there's a good good character like and, and but here's the thing it failed. Uh-huh. So I'm being told for years of this culture war that, oh, we need comics to be more diverse and all this stuff. 
Okay, well, DC just handed you eight new comics that were great. They were with good talent on the art and the writing, because DC is... That's where all the best talent is, for the most part. Marvel's yeah. got a couple people, but... Their books were cheap. They're only two ninety nine, not three ninety nine. Mm-hmm. And you didn't come to buy them. You didn't buy them. Yeah. So you're sitting here crying. Oh, comics is full of white misogynists and blah blah blah. Okay. Well, you got what you wanted. Yeah. And you didn't buy it. All you bought. What what told me was, you only come running when it's pushing the culture war. It's not that there's a black character. Yeah. It has to be a black character talking about. You know the man, the white man's keeping him down. It has to be a female character. It's not enough to have a female character. It has to be a female character talking about her feminism. She don't need no man. Yep. Right? Because when it's just a good female, when it's just Wonder Woman, no one's caring. You, you've had Wonder Woman for what? How old is she? Like seventy years old? Or she's like, yeah. It, it, it's not enough. You look at the movie. The Wonder Woman movie came out. It was well done. It was a success. But it wasn't until the Captain Marvel movie came out that all the people are like, look, we finally got a female. Like, what did you miss? Have you had Wonder Woman? Oh, because yeah. Wonder Woman wasn't spouting your agenda. Yeah, it's, that's exactly And it. so yeah. it's a big, what I say is it's a big lie. The culture war is a lie. Mm-hmm. They're just using women and people of color and marginalized, you know, different groups of people for as puppets, as, yeah. as tools for their social politics yep yeah it's uh interesting and um and the other thing uh, too like so this is a good that was a good segue into this so i'll ask you this question now i've seen two extreme uh opinions on this I've seen uh, a really extreme opinion on this from someone on the comics gate side and i've seen the opposite on someone on like the anti-comics gate side so on the uh, comics gate side i saw this on twitter Someone tweeted out that you can never, under, under under any circumstances, should any kind of politics or social commentary be ever in entertainment or in comic books. Now I've seen the opposite end, the anti-comics gate, where every piece of entertainment always has to be political and push a social agenda. So um, I, I, I kind of dis- I disagree with both. So I know, what do you think of that? That's a really good question. Um, my stance is this. There's a difference between politics and politicizing. Uh-huh. There's a difference between telling a story with moral lessons and proselytizing. Now, I think somewhere along the lines, the messages have gotten blurred when you know Comics Gate came out once and said, uh, you know, we, we don't want politics in our comics. Well, I don't have a problem with politics in comics, honestly. If you want to have a comic book, uh, you know, and I, and, I, and I kind of credit, actually, you know, Marvel previously doing some decent things like the original Civil War, yep. some of the MCU stuff, where, you know, you have the ideological differences between Captain America and Iron Man. And they're arguing with each other about their beliefs. But they're never arguing to the audience. Yeah. They're never trying to tell the audience like oh you are a bigot because you you know like they're new. and these new marvel books that's the problem when you see peter parker slouching on the couch without a job and living off his girlfriend uh-huh. and he's got a t-shirt saying you know ask me about my feminist agenda that's that is not anything relevant to the story that's the writer speaking to the audience yeah and that is bad storytelling now if you want to do here's a good i have to give marvel credit if you want to do what current marvel is somehow anonymous i can't believe they're doing this in their uh chip zadarsky miniseries spider-man life story yeah where they're able to tell this story about vietnam and they have characters arguing about was vietnam good is it bad they never talk to the reader and try to tell you how you should feel about Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And that's done right. Yeah. Spider-Man Life Story is an example of politics and comics done right. Um, Iceman, America Chavez, yeah. <laughs> recent comics are done wrong. Watching female Thor talk about, you know, she's going to smack, her, you know, 
this, she don't need no man, and she's going to smack, I, there's someone, I've got the dialogue, I'm trying to remember now, where she's beating up on this villain. Yeah, I think I know the one, husband yeah. husband and wife villain team, and then the wife sides with her afterwards, and just be like, <laughs> we got to stick together because we're women, you know, and I'm just like, what am I reading? Yeah. Um, it's, that's the problem, and I think the message gets lost. So when you hear people sometimes on one side, say the comics gate side, say, well, I don't want my politics, I think ultimately that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Don't don't preach to me. Just just tell me a story. It's okay to have a character in your story believe in God. Yeah. And that character goes to church. But all of a sudden, when that character starts talking to the viewer and making the viewer feel like, oh, you should you should worship God. Now you're yeah. preaching to the viewer, and I don't want that. And I'm a Christian. I, I, that's not doesn't that's not good storytelling. Yeah, no, that's a so good, good it's, example. It's, it's not just the politics. It's not just your ideology. It's what you're doing with it. And it's wrong no matter what side you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a good example. And uh, another really good example I can give of politics being in a story, but the story was so good that, and it was handled so well, is, uh, now this is actually outside of the realm of comics, but... Um, there's an author, you probably heard of this guy because they made some of his books in the movies, uh, Dan Brown. Oh yeah. So I've read all of his books and the most recent one that came out was called Origin. So it dealt with, because like you hear about nationalism now a lot in the news. And so the story dealt with that in the book about nationalism, kind of looked at it. Uh, but the, the story was so good and so fascinating that it you know, it was, and he did it such a good job on, on telling it. So obviously, you, when you read the book, he's against nationalism. You, you, that's pretty easy to get that from the author. And the, the story is uh, kind of done in a way that, you know, is, it, it, but it, it references some historical events and stuff. But this, but that wasn't the only part of the story. That's just one thing in the story. Uh, but there's so many other fascinating things in the story that the story was so good. That, you know, you, okay, well, I, I can tell this guy is against nationalism and all that, but, you know, and obviously he's maybe trying to make a point in this book uh, arguing against nationalism, but he told such a good story doing it, you know, you're cool with it. Um, so that that's one example I could think of, is that one. And um, as for uh, another good example for TV, I don't know if you've ever watched the show Battlestar Galactica. Oh, one of my, the, the new one, the remake yeah. one from Sci-Fi Channel? Yeah, the the, re, the newer one. Yes, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Yeah, so I was like totally hooked on that show. But they did a really good episode about abortion. And uh, they had it that one of the girls came from a colony where abortion was outlawed. And so anyway, she hit on the Galactica and she wanted, she was pregnant and wanted to have an abortion. So the situation that they're in is completely different from the situation we're here in on Earth, right? Because human humanity's on the verge of extinction, and so, you know, that the president sa says, you know, I've, you know, I've always, uh, you know, stood by, you know, women having to be able to decide what they can and can't do with their bodies. And then uh, Commander Adama says to her, "Well, you know, I'm just that's true, but you know, I'm just thinking about what you said. You know, we better start having babies." So yeah, in the end, a, that, that you know show, which one I'm talking about, yeah. That, so that in show, you remind me so much. Like one of the things I loved about that show was the dynamic between Adama and uh, the president. I forget her name. Um, Rosalind, I think. Rosalind, yeah. Yeah. And they both had sort of opposing political ideologies. Yeah. Um, but neither one of them was ever presented as this guy's completely right and this person's completely wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. whatever. It was just, both of them had a point, right? And it's like, oh, man, these are hard decisions. And here's the pros and cons of this way. And then here's the pros and cons of this. And both of them were very respectable characters, both mm -hmm. of them really strong characters. Yeah, it was. That's a another thing, too. It was a position in comics books. A lot of times it's very sloppy writing because in order to sell an argument, they'll usually debase a character yes. so that oh see this character is dumb and they believe the thing that I'm trying to preach against so therefore it's bad because look at the, the, the dumb characters arguing it uh -huh. instead of actually making an argument you know then they just have their main hero you know, Cap Captain Marvel oh this should be the way it's like okay like 
anyways. Yeah, but uh, just the last thing I wanted to say about that Battlestar Galactic episode is the, the, in, the interesting ending was to the episode. Uh, for anyone who's going to be listening, doesn't know how the doesn't know about this, but in the end, they let the girl have the abortion. But then after the president makes the choice, they they ban it. They said there there can be even though it's something she totally disagrees with, she makes that decision that because humanity is on such such a brink of extinction, they actually outlaw it in the show, like in the fleet. So this one person, okay, you can have the abortion, and no one else after this can have abortions because we cannot afford it. We have to be procreating, making as many humans as we can. So it was a really interesting episode that took that took a, like an interesting look at abortion. Yeah. It made a fascinating exactly. episode. And, it, and yeah. it presented it from its view, like its own universal viewpoint. Like, obviously, yeah. humanity is not stuck on a handful of starships floating in space facing extinction. So it's not even really able to promote its ideas to us because it's in a different circumstance. It never mm-hmm. tries to. It stays within its own box, presents a story within its boundaries, and lets the, re- uh, the reader or the consumer or the viewer, whatever... Um, kind of just come to their own conclusions and I remember that that story a little bit um, and thinking along like what would I feel what would I do if I were at her place uh-huh. never once thinking what I would do at my place like here on earth because they were separate and it never tried to cross that boundary yeah it never tried to push their ideology into the real world uh-huh. that's, yeah. what, and that's why I was you know that show is excellent I mean it's excellent for so many reasons but it's a good way as long as just stay in your world yeah. You can have politics all you want. In fact, you should have politics. That's humanity. <laughs> um, just don't don't try to preach. Yeah. So now, um, I guess the other thing I, I, I wanted to ask is, so now, obviously on Twitter, it's like a battlefield, like between anti comics gate and comics gate. So now, is there anything that you think that? comics is there any do you have any criticisms of comics gate you think there's things that they're doing that they shouldn't be doing or like what, what do you think what do you think are some of the things they're doing wrong and some of the things they're doing right um well this is a very difficult thing because i've always strived to maintain the idea that comics gate isn't a group mm-hmm. it's an idea and you either ascribe to the idea or you don't. Yeah. But in order to stay true to the question, I'm going to address it as if it were a group. Because obviously we are talking about a group of people. Yeah. And that group of people, I think the mistakes that they're making, number one, are losing sight of what I just described. Yeah. That it's an idea that you either ascribe to or you don't. And they're turning it into an identity. Yeah. Uh, that's number one mistake. And the, the, the number two mistake that I would say is falls in line with that. Be- now that it's become an identity, it's being reshaped to go in line with the people who identify with it. Yeah. And that's always dangerous mm-hmm. uh, because people don't always have the same ideas yeah um you know what well, people I, I would get in arguments sometimes with anti-comic skaters and i would always try to say look look it's just an idea quit labeling us as a group quit condemning us all blanket whether as if we're all the same you know and just be like well this comic skater did this and that and it's like look i'm a comic skater and i like coke more than pepsi does that mean comic skate is about coke <laughs> no <laughs> Yeah, you can have a different comic skater who likes Pepsi more than Coke. It has nothing to do with the other. Comic skate is only about comic skate and nothing else. It's not about all the other things that a certain comic skater brings to the table. Yeah, you know, and one of those things is the most standout thing is the whole white nationalism thing and the Fox Day issues and things. It's like, look, if someone likes Fox Day, it has nothing to do with comic skate. Yeah, um, if they hate Fox Day. Again, has nothing to do with comics. Gate. Comics gate is about the idea that comics shouldn't be politicized, the characters should not be hijacked, that, you know, and professionals should be professional to the fans. Yeah, that's it. That's simple. But it's been mutated, mm-hmm. and so now what we have is 
the most vocal sect of Comics Gate, if you will. Uh, and the most active have turned the concept into being about this new side industry of independently created comics. Yeah. Now, I 100% support independently created comics. But Comics Gate was never about that. Comics Gate was what the hell did you do to Captain America? Uh -huh. Fix it. Someone complained to you about Captain America and you called him a bigot? Stop that. Fix it. That's yeah. what Comics Gate is about. It's about fixing the problem. Stop messing up. Make the industry better. And somewhere along the line, and I, and I I credit it towards this thing where people turn it into an identity. You've got a large group of fans. They're very much pro. I want these Indiegogo books. I love these Indiegogo creators. I support them. And that's fine. 100%. You do that. But don't hijack Comics Gate for your purpose. You're doing the exact same thing that these other identitarians are doing yeah. when they're purple-haired, blue-haired, you know, pushing their social agendas. They got into the industry, and now they're using the industry to push their agendas. They're hijacking things for their desires, the things that they like. It's easy for us to point fingers and say, I don't like what, what you like. I don't like mm -hmm. that, and what you're doing is wrong. But then we go, well, the things I like, now I'm going to hijack something else. It's like, you're, you're, in, you're just becoming hypocritical and it's unfortunate because I think everyone's heart was in the right place yeah but it's losing the message now and I think there's a lot of people who ascribe more to the side of comic tape which I the more purest side if I'll put a label to it where it's just there's an idea and I support that idea I think those type of people are becoming very disheartened yeah and we're seeing a lot of them just sort of lying down and just being like whatever it's not even worth fighting anymore because when everyone was behind a rallying cry you know sort of like and and i like to credit zach zach was probably the the best example of you know holding the flag that everyone just rallied behind there was sort of a unity and a singular idea yeah and when he started making a comic book and decided i don't really want to be in the front forefront anymore which is fine he, he owes no one anything um then people just started without 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 a leader if you will not that he was there officially a leader but they had no one to follow they started looking and this other group formed and mm -hmm. it's a popular group and now we're here where we where we are so i think that's the dilution of the message and the hijacking for other people's visions, I think is the singular worst mistake yeah. if I were to critique Comicscape. But I, I still am 100% believer of the original message. Yeah. Now, do you think that uh, Comicscape is making any headway? Or um, do you think... Because from my perspective, like uh, looking at, at, at on the whole the battle on Twitter, uh, to me... I don't think there's going to be a winning side to this thing. I think in the end, this, now this I might be wrong, but I think in the end, I think eventually Disney is going to fold up Marvel Comics, and when that happens, the undertow from that is going to suck down a lot of smaller publishers, and it's going to really change comics. And then I think that might actually be the end of the battle between Comicsgate and Anti-Comicsgate. But what do you think of that? That's a really good question, and I think I think I see a lot of truth to that. I, I think um, I think there's a very strong possibility that Disney does fold up Marvel. Um, it's the, the evidence is just like right in front of us. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in history, has Marvel Comics ever in history outsourced their books to an indie, indie publisher? It, it, to my knowledge, I mean, yeah, I haven't researched never. it, but to my knowledge... Marvel Comics has never said, hey, you guys, you, you guys print Spider-Man books. I mean, uh -huh. IDW right now is making Spider-Man books. They're making Avengers comics. 
they're making Star Wars comics. Um, and I think there's another Marvel book they're doing. And uh, I'm just flabbergasted. I'm like, wait a minute. Marvel Comics is the biggest comics publisher in the bit. Why would someone else be doing Marvel Comics? Disney doesn't even allow Marvel to make Disney comics. Every yeah. single Disney comic is published by someone else. And I'm sitting here thinking, Disney owns the biggest comics publisher in the business. Uh -huh. Why would you give it to a third party to publish your books? These are clear indicators, right? They don't paint the entire picture. We still, there's still only hints, but they're important hints that things are not kosher. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is not going right at Marvel. There's problems. We're seeing other clear indicators like in 2018 marvel decided to reboot everything everything went down a new number one for everything and i yeah. thought okay this is a cash grab the, the the industry was down for a third consecutive year and marvel was down in their in their uh, market shares all these problems and this is a desperation move get some quick quick cash show stockholders or whatever like look we made money you know we're, yeah. we're not in the red and then in 2019 i was like you can't do that anymore but but they're doubling down they're uh -huh. doing even more than they were doing in 2018 and i was like this is an indicate this is the death throes you yeah. know of something dying trying for one last gasp of desperation um, I mean, look at this new Marvel 1000 book. It's just like, it's a complete cash grab. There's yeah. no other way to describe it. Yeah, it's there special. is no other way to describe that. It's a gimmick. Yeah, and it's, this is short term. A, a healthy company is thinking about the long term. They're thinking about where we're we going to be in 10 years, 20 years. How do we build our brand to be bigger than ever? Yeah. An unhealthy company, a company that's dying, says we don't care all that matters is is our annual fiscal report <laughs> mm -hmm. you know or we're all out of a job and this is what i see with marvel right now and the, these little testing the waters with idw printing marvel comics I, it can't be ignored in my opinion and so many people are there's like oh whatever that's just normal you know it's it is absolutely 100 percent not normal and you hit the nail on the head, I think, because Marvel is the guiding light of the industry. Yeah. It, where, where Marvel goes, the industry follows. Mm -hmm. And for my sake, as a big DC fan, uh, I and I try to tell people, I'm like, look, DC is your only, unless Marvel somehow miraculously gets its act together, which I just don't see happening. I, I see Marvel completely having to crumble is the only answer to them fixing themselves. I think they're so far lost yep. that the only way that they'll finally go, yep, we done messed up, is when it completely hits rock bottom. They're just so delusional. They're so... yeah. No, like no, ma no level of failure seems to ever hit them in the face and make them realize, yeah. No, so I, I'm like, look, DC is the only... Because if DC and Marvel both go, yeah. then the industry is toast. Uh, it's dead, yeah. But if Marvel fails, but DC's healthy... The industry will struggle, and there will be a lot of famine. Hey, yeah, there will. But be. it will, it'll maintain. Like there, it, it, it has enough, and DC will eat up a lot of market share, so it'll become a lot bigger uh -huh. um, than it is currently. And so that's my thing about it. it's like I when I'm pushing my agenda, if you will, it's like, look, guys, DC's doing good stuff. Support that good stuff that they're doing. You know, yeah. if they're doing something stupid, by all means, criticize it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to be a blind supporter of DC. But right now they're doing some good stuff and we should support them doing good stuff so we can encourage them to keep doing good stuff and your original question i, I know i took this down a path but you asked about does comments gate have an effect and i want to say yeah because we're seeing the the companies make certain decisions they still make bonehead decisions yeah um, but look at marvel today versus marvel two years ago uh -huh. Right, uh, they got rid of all the stupid X Men, blue, black, green, you know, the Rainbow X Men. It's gone. We'll sweep that on, you know. Now, Uncanny X Men isn't good. I'm not gonna buy it, but it's a hell of a lot better than what they were doing 
before. It's a step forward. So yeah. that went from an F grade to a D. D is still bad, but it's forward. Uh -huh. um, look at Hulk. We don't have Gogurt Hulk running around anymore. Yeah. We've got a Hulk that uh, is pretty, uh, a lot of people are happy, you know, uh -huh. with what's going on currently with uh, the Mortal Hulk. We've got Avengers. I mean, say what you will about Marvel exploiting the fan base with War of the Realms, but at least the Avengers is now the, all the characters we like, you know? Yeah. It's recognizable. Um, they brought back Wolverine. Got rid of this whole stupid, oh, look at the all new Wolverine and her other pal, other all new Wolverine. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> it's like, why would you get rid of your most popular, it's just, you know? They, yeah, it they, doesn't make sense. I, They'll never admit it. You'll never see Marvel come out and be like, heard the comics game. And that'll never happen. No. But I, you'd have to be a complete fool or just 100% deluded to think that all this happened because that's what the normal SJW crowd actually really wanted. That, yeah. that happened because of them. They were yeah. trying to repeat. No, 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 no. It's clearly who they were trying to not, it maybe not make happy, but to not anger any further. Uh -huh. Look at the tweets that come out of Marvel. We still get some stupid boneheaded ones, but it's not nearly what it was a year and a half ago. Where you were just like, oh my god, what what is happening? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more controlled. And mm -hmm. most of the social media nonsense are by people that don't work at Marvel anymore. Yeah. Right? Um, so, I think Marvel has listened. And they've made small concessions. And those are indicators that Comicsgate has had an effect. It's, is it as effective as we all wish it be? Of course yeah. not. But as long as that trajectory continues in a positive manner, we should recognize it, we should appreciate it, and we should just keep pushing for that. Yeah. And uh, the other thing, I don't think... This is something that anti-Comics Gate doesn't realize. I think they're under the impression that it's basically... Comics Gate is uh, basically just whoever is following Ethan Van Skyver and Diversity in Comics. But uh, what they don't realize is, uh, now this is like an anecdotal thing, but uh, the comic book store that I go, there, go to, um, or there's a friend of mine who, he's not into the culture work at all. So he doesn't know what's going on with Comics Gate. He's not on Facebook, he's not on Twitter, nothing like that. And uh, so he's totally ignorant to the whole situation. But now, so, uh, even though he's totally ignorant to the whole thing, he is dropping titles like crazy. Because he, 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 but it's something he can't put, he can't put his finger on it when, when we talk about it. Now he kind of knows more now because of me. I got to tell him some stuff. But he's kind, he's very, he doesn't really want anything to do with it. But even before that, he would always tell me like the story. I don't know what it is, but the stories just aren't any good. And the big thing is, the artwork is just, he just will flip open, he'll flip open a book and be like, what is this artwork? Like it's terrible, and. Like the stories just don't interest him, and but he's still just sort of buying the monthlies. Just it's like a habit almost, but he doesn't read them. But his his compared to what he was buying, and he was a hardcore Marvel guy. His monthly pull has really dropped, and uh, there's other guys like that that come to the comic store. So for every guy who is a comic skater, how many more guys who are like that that they don't know what's going on, but they just know something's up, and the comics just aren't as good, but they don't know why, and they're just dropping the comic comics so i think it's you know what i mean i think it's a lot i think it's going more against marvel than what they realize i think there's a lot of silent uh i think there's like a, a very silent majority that's there that's uh disillusioned with marvel comics and the anti-comics gate think it's only the guys that are beacon off on twitter that are so th i think they think the problem is much smaller than what it actually is not realizing there's a lot of people out there that they're not on social media they're not making YouTube videos, but they are very quietly closing up their wallets. That is a huge point. Um, I would say Comicsgate is the vocal dissenters. Comicsgate are the people that are still buying comics, mm -hmm. for the most part, right? Um, and that's why it's super important that the comic industry listen to Comicsgate. 
because the vast, vast majority of people that were disenfranchised with the industry, they didn't join Common Scheme. They just left. Yeah. And they may not even know Comics Gate existed. I didn't know Comics Gate existed for, you know, I was out of comics for over 20 years. Yep. I didn't leave because of the same reasons. But I certainly didn't come back a couple of times when I was thinking about it because of what was happening. And I was like, this is atrocious. Oh my God, stay away. Go back to what I was doing. Um, yeah. And that's the, the deal. Comics Gate are just the few remainder people that are so passionate and they're like we love our comics and you're making us so mad because we don't want to hate our comics anymore Uh and we want to be able to give you feedback and we want you to be able to at least say hey we're listening thanks for your feedback instead of responding back to us f you you bigots um you're just all a bunch of racists and we don't care about you if you don't like our politics don't buy our books like what so what industry tells fans you know consumers not to buy the product like it, it just be, it got to a point where it was just so utterly ridiculous and you you hit the nail on the head with your example with your friend there are so many comic fans that they've been doing it for so long it's such a part of what they do that even if they're not interested in the book they just keep picking it up because it's ingrained I, I yeah. collect this book I mean when I left comics I was disenfranchised with X-Men for probably a good year or two but I just kept getting it because I had been doing it for 10 years you know uh-huh. Um, and then eventually it got to a point where I was like, oh, and I, like I said, I don't even really remember what the ultimate trigger was, but that's what happens. And then, and when you lose that person, when they find, when that kind of person finally just gives in, it's like, I'm not anymore. It's so hard to win them back. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, um, Marvel, unfortunately, more than just the culture war has been struggling ever since, um, you know, their bankruptcy back in the 90s. Yeah. And instead of rebuilding a strong company, they hired people, put new people in charge that tried to uh, economize Marvel. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they, they did cost-cutting measures. So the Marvel that we see today is a victim of 20 years of bad management, of people being in charge, going, "Oh, we don't, we're, we're losing money hand over fist." Well, we'll raise prices of the comic books. We'll cut the quality of the paper that we print on. We'll fire all of the talent that costs all this money. And we'll hire all these cheap artists. We'll, we'll stop inking our books so we don't have to pay inkers. You know, we'll get rid of all of our classic editors and just hire a bunch of interns. Everything that they've done, they've, they've caught, cut costs, cut costs, cut costs. Well, the problem is you can only do that for so long. Uh-huh. And now Marvel is at a bare bones operating level. There's nothing left to cut. Yeah. Um, well, now what do they do? Well, gimmicks. Let's let's try to market and get people because fortunately, we've got the strongest IP in the industry. You know, it's. That's, everyone loves Marvel, so we're going to just bank on this. But even then, that can only last for so long. You can only reboot Spider-Man so many times. Yeah. You know, eventually people get tired of it. And what's kept the industry going, and this is one of the mistakes I think almost everyone in the industry is doing, is they're ignoring the collector. The whole reason the comic book industry exists today as we know it mm-hmm. is be- the transition from newsstand to direct market in the 70s. Yeah. When comics became a collector hobby. Now, there have been people who've collected comics forever and ever, right? That's, but when it became like a thing, when comic collecting became something that not just weirdos did, but it like, oh, comic collect- And shops started opening dedicated to the collector of comics. Mm-hmm. That started happening in the 70s. In the 80s, it really started taking off. And that's where you saw the drop of the newsstand yes. into the direct market. The direct market is all... We don't even have newsstand anymore. All we have is direct market. And the reason why direct market exists is 100% purely because of collectors. Now, some people argue, well, you know, actually, there's still people that just read comics. Yes, there's plenty of people that just read comics. But the collectors are the whales. Those are the yeah. guys. There's a guy at my comic book store. 
he comes in on, on Wednesday if I get there early enough. And he literally almost buys a... Well, he does buy a short box. Uh-huh. He buys a short box, and he almost fills it up every week with, with his pull. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, my God. You know? Um, but this guy has got money, obviously. And he's got the desire. And this is the guy that you need as an industry person. That's the guy you want to please. Yeah. That guy's keeping the industry afloat. Not the, not the reader guy who comes in and says, can I get my copy of Man Eaters? Like... Uh-huh. You know, no. This guy's spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars every week. He's keeping the LCS afloat. The LCSs keep the direct market afloat. Yeah. Because um, lest anyone forget, the direct market is only the LCSs. If you cut them out, the direct market's gone. Yep. Right? So, um, I forget exactly how I told you. I get more with <laughs> it on these things. But yeah. um, it's, it's really important that the industry listen and remember collectors. Now, when you, what Marvel's doing with rebooting all the time, every time you reboot, yes, you have an opportunity to get someone to jump on your book. Mm-hmm. But the more important thing is you give people an opportunity to jump off your book. Yeah. So if you're a person who's buying, I don't know, the Hulk or whatever, and you're just like not happy, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, Hulk's ending because they're starting a new series. You're just like, okay, cool, I'm done. Yeah. You, you know, like you, you feel like I, I collected it. It's over. Move on. Yeah. Don't want people to have that feeling to move on. The comics exist to, you know, captivate readers because you read that last page of the comic book, and they go, "Oh my gosh, I need to see what happens next. I can't believe what I just saw next yeah. month. I got They're gonna, you know, and they come back to the store and they want to get. That's what you want every month after month. The- Not this uh, wink, it be over. Yeah. Now the, the one and the other thing that I noticed um, now I noticed this this has been going on for quite a while. I've noticed this before, you know, the whole uh, SJW invasion culture war thing, all that. Is I started to notice that comics, monthly comics, were written in a way that they were designed so that they could reprint them in a trade paperback a few months down the road. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of got away from, you know, cause when I was a kid. Like, uh, when I would, because I used to buy a lot of Batman or a lot of Hulk, those were my two favorite guys, and I'd buy a Batman comic or a Hulk comic, and it would have a complete story in that comic, like a beginning, middle, and end. But now it's like a small portion of the story, and, you know, that they drag out over 12 issues, so then they can come and re-release it as a trade paperback and then start a new arc kind of thing. So it's almost like they're using, using the floppies just to fuel the trade paperback market, and, um, which... To me, I'd wish it was done more the old way when you could buy a comic and you get a complete story in a comic, like a complete episode in one comic. And uh, But now it just seems like it's getting harder to do because the page count is dropping, but the price is going up and the artwork is sinking downwards. I don't know if, you, uh, I don't know if you've noticed the same thing or not. Oh, I definitely have. I, honestly, I think there's really big pros and cons to this. I think I have. And real quick, if you'll indulge me, a shameless plug here for my my boy, uh, Thinking Critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do a, a, I'm part of a stream that I do every week. It's usually on a Saturday morning. We just did our last stream. It's called Comic Aficionados. We talked about, I, at least I mentioned a little bit about the trades here. I actually, personally, really do like writing for the trades. I think it has opened up comic books to have deeper and more involving storylines. Yeah. And if you look back to some of the all-time great comic stories, they're usually miniseries mm-hmm. that equate to what we consider today for writing for the trade. Watch yeah. Dark Knight Returns, you know, um, even Batman Year One, you know, that, even though that wasn't a miniseries, it was an arc would equate to what we consider today writing for the trade. Now, there definitely was a craft that old-time writers had that I do miss where they could write a single issue and give you a solid story in one issue. Yeah. And I think mod- many, many modern writers are not capable of this. No, they're not. <laughs> Just as I also think that there are many writers modern day 
that have taken the writing for the trade thing and abused it to take a story that should just be one issue and stretch it out over six. Uh-huh. Yes. So, just because a story is six issues is not inherently better, but to a good writer who takes full advantage of this, um, then you it allows for way better stories than can ever be achieved in those singular issues. Uh-huh. Um, they both have their place, in my opinion. I think a strong singular issue um, we should have writers that can do that. We should have comics that can do that. But I think the really good writing and the writing for the trade, when it's done well, has produced better storytelling overall. And so I'll defend it on that merit. Yeah. Um, and the other thing about the, the, from just a monetary standpoint, or the why the industry is doing it, is you just look, because that's where the money is going. Yeah. Uh, the ICV2 just published recently. I don't know if you've had a chance to look. You know, the annual revenues for 2018 and uh, the bulk of the revenue comes from the books mm-hmm. uh, the book market that's all trades well it's not all trades scholastic stuff and everything as well but um, that's where the money if you look at the graphs the comic book store sales are dropping and the bookstore sales are increasing bookstores don't sell floppies no. So you have to translate that and go, well, that must be. And some people who will argue with me will say things like, see, look, Ash, that's an indicator the industry is growing bigger. Wrong. Because while those, while the overall revenues are increasing, the profits are dwindling. Comic yeah. companies make far less revenue, or sorry, much less profit off of a trade than they do a floppy. You pay four ninety nine, five ninety nine for your floppy versus what four ten you know, anywhere from nine ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine for your trade. Uh-huh. Like you're it, it's 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 easy math. Yeah. Um, the trades are more expensive materials. Um so yes, more are being sold and the overall gross revenue is higher but the returns are less. The profit margins are narrower. Uh-huh. Um, so it's it's not it's not a good indicator. Uh, and, but they're chasing it because it's growth. And if you're a business, it's like, oh, well, that's what people are buying. I think the mistake here is that the companies need to manage both really well because the death of floppies will necessarily impact the trades. You, yeah. can't, you can't make trades at the level of quality without the floppies to back them up. Yeah. You'll still make trades. They'll just be cheaper artists and cheaper writers. Um, But, yeah, (laughs) it's too much work to just sell for that lower, much less profit Mm -hmm. level. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That does make sense. Uh, So I guess... uh, We'll get ready to wrap it up here, but I just wanted to ask you one last question here. Um, so, how much longer do you see this going on? This battle with this culture war within comics, like do you, like how many more years down the road do you see this? Do you think it's getting close to the end of it, or do you think it has a ways to go yet? I think this culture war is being driven by the greater uh, overall. Uh, political and culture war that we're seeing just in societies in general, not just with comics. Mm-hmm. Um, so without, I mean, I don't really necessarily want to go down the political lines per se, uh, but you know, the whole anti-Trump constant movement, we're seeing in society today a massive division between the ultra-progressive left and the right, which hates what the left is doing but then can't really seem to do much because they're being held hostage by you know the the machinations that the mm-hmm. left do and you know people people get fired from their jobs because they get harassed anyways yeah that is what's affecting that's affecting it's affecting the movie industry the tv industry it's it's everywhere we see it in comics because that's what we're into yeah um i see it going to answer your question i see it going as long as that continues and that might be a generation um 
you know, if we, if we look back, this kind of the similar thing happened back in the 60s, you know, uh-huh. into the mid 70s. We saw a certain generation that came, they were the kids of the greatest generation, so to speak. And they were all disenfranchised, and, oh, down with the Republic, you know, it's the war in the Vietnam era, and was, they were just anti establishment, all this stuff. That's kind of reminiscent of what we're seeing today. And I think it might take until they have their kids start being influential in society. Their kids are most likely, because people tend to be counter to what their parents' generation will come and just be like, my parents are dumb. This was a dumb way, you know, and, and swing the pendulum the other way around. Yeah. So we might be into this for another 10 years, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm, a, up. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a little bit more optimistic now than I was a few years ago about this, because a few years ago I thought, well, this is never going to end. Like, there's no light here at all. But uh, recently there's been a lot of stories, and I think a big culprit in the fueling a lot of this stuff is a lot of these, like, really crappy news websites, like Polygon, the Mary Sue, BuzzFeed. Um, they, I think they fuel a lot of outrage culture because these outrage headlines get a lot of clicks. Uh, but now a lot of them are dying, and they're dying pretty fast. Um, like, uh, the io9 just got sold dirt cheap disney just lost 400 million on uh might have even been more than 400 million on uh, vice and uh, a lot of them are you know they're 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 going bankrupt they're turning because a lot of them uh, i guess resorted on uh, facebook's algorithm to actually grow their business and then facebook changed their algorithm on them and sunk a lot of these companies and i think that's a lot of the i think that they, they cause a lot of the the fuel that goes into the outrage culture and that and Twitter and I know I've heard Twitter is sl- it's slowly dying but it is dying Twitter is dying off so I think that combined with Twitter um, so I think like as we start to see those websites die off because people just get tired of going to them they get tired of the you know reading story after story about why this video game is problematic or this movie is problematic and racist or you know what I mean they just get tired of it so sure. I think they're they're slowly dying off, so I think it might be it'll be a few years yet, but I think I I, I don't think we'll see it too much longer. That's what my hope is anyway. I don't think we'll see it too much longer as these sites start to die off. I think you'll you'll see it start to slow down because a lot of this is I think coming out of internet culture. Uh, for sure, I think social media plays a much bigger part than the what I would call the fake media, the IO9s and the BuzzFeeds, the, mm-hmm. all these. And I'm glad, I'm glad to see all these guys folding because it's like, finally people are waking up and realizing I probably shouldn't pay to have fake news. <laughs> like, yeah. if this is a scam, you know, you should, if you buy an apple, it should be an apple, not a pear. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad to see these guys folding, but I believe more people are influenced by the people they associate with. And mm-hmm. social media allows us to associate with many more voices yeah. than we used to. You know, we have a small circle of friends, but on social media, you can have hundreds of friends, you know, yeah. constantly. And when you're in these echo chambers, it's just easy to have your life view is skewed. But even more importantly than that, it's just they're, they've invaded the professional workspace. I mean, it's it's fine that, that if, if uh, these changes happen in the consumer side of things. But as long as Marvel is run by a bunch of ideological nut jobs, uh-huh. that what's going to change? Well, right, like, yeah, they're not listening to, I mean, you watch them fail time and time again. And they just, they, they don't react. They don't do it. Like, oh, I guess, I guess people don't want to buy Iceman. Let's make a new one. Yeah. The, I mean, I mean, Captain Marvel's on her ninth reboot. <laughs> Just so I, I believe that until something major happens, either a new people, new voices can get into these companies to try to you know shape where they go, or cataclysmic failure. You know where things just burn up and everyone's like, oh my god, jump ship, and it's you know that's finally something you can't ignore any further. Mm-hmm. I hope you're right. Honestly, I'm on your side there. I I, I wish I wish for the best. Yeah. Um, but my my cynicism kind of just tells me that 
it's got to get worse before it's going to get better. Yeah. I mean, you'll never completely be rid of those people. They're, they're always going to be out there because they've always been there. They're just really loud. Sure. Now. So you're never going to be completely rid of them. Um, but yeah, so it's an interesting thing. So I guess we'll wrap it up there. So um, any last uh, thing you want to say? Anything about your channel? Um, oh, yeah. Um, for anyone who's listening and you've found anything I've had to say somewhat, somewhat interesting, uh, my channel is Ash on Comics. Three words. Simple to find. Um, and I would have loved it so much if you'd come to the channel, watch some couple videos, and give me some feedback. One of my things that I do on my channel is I try to respond to anyone that gives me feedback, unless you're just being a troll. Um, <laughs> I genuinely want it. Like I said, I'm not there to be the next PewDiePie. I'm there because I love comics. And I love talking to people who also love comics. But I also want to put out a somewhat decent product. So if there's something that's working for you on my channel, let me know so I can do more of it. If something's not working that well, let me know so I can pare it down or change it. Um, and talk with me about comics. Um, that's really what I want to do. You can follow me on Twitter at Ash1138. That's the numbers, 1138. And um, that's it. I think uh, it's been really fun. This was a... I, I love doing this. Uh, too bad we can't do these all the time. Because I yeah. said everything about me I can say, I guess. <laughs> well, uh... Yeah, no, it, no, it went pretty good. Uh, so yeah, just in closing, I guess. Uh, so yeah, everyone, I've checked out Ash's channel, watched some of his videos, very good content. So yeah, go over and check his channel out. And I will leave a link to his channel in the uh, description of this video below. And uh, so that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and I will see you at the next one. Thank you to all of my subscribers, and thank you for watching this video. And if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon for notification when new videos are uploaded.